Good morning. Denise Dryden here, Whitefish, Montana, and we're going to talk today about enabling. And um, these Sunday mornings are just really fun for me because it gives me an ex a, a way to um, explore different topics that I'm working on with clients, that I'm working on personally, that you know that we all are sort of working with all the time. And so uh, these are intended to be like a 10 or 12 minute little exploration into some of the things that um, that work for us and some of the things that don't. So uh, we're going to talk about the faces of enabling. Hi Kelly, I'm so glad you're here. Ah, okay, so here we'll settle in here now, okay. So uh, the faces of enabling, right? Um, to enable is, and of course I'm always going to start with my dictionary definition, to give strength or ability to. Ah, happy Sunday, Kelly. Uh, enabling, enabling is to remove the natural consequences, usually in context of the addict. So, you know, we've heard about, you know, an enabler or enabling or a rescuing parent or a rescuing codependent, and that started in context with addiction which is when our fear for the addict becomes so big that we try to intervene. We bail out with money, we bail out with services and time, and we give and we give so that that person doesn't keep sliding down into their own experience with drugs and alcohol um, or whatever the addiction is. So enabling came from a, you know, like to enable is, is a technological term. But enabling became a psychological term that applies to those of us, and I've been there and still continue to be at different times in my life, depending on awareness, <laughs> an enabler, okay? So because enabling is also uh, always attached to codependence, it's when we're compelled to solve other people's problems for them, that we get something. It's well-intentioned. It's a de well-intentioned desire to help, of course. However, when this fit system of help becomes, uh, it's attached. It means that the enabler is over-functioning and the other, the person we're trying to help, under-functions. So, it, you know, it's kind of like there's two people. This one starts to wobble, right? And this one gets bigger and stronger and says, here, I can help you. I can help you. And this one starts to lay back and go, you know, I don't have to do anything. Mom's here. Dad's here. My brother's here. My wife is here, you know, whatever that is. And it, it becomes an, a, an imbalanced relationship. Um, so it comes from love, but it also comes from a really deep fear. And that fear morphs into control. And so when we enable, what we're doing is we're going off of an internal set of fears. And then we're trying to control the outer third dimensional, you know, physical world in order to make sure that nothing happens in that scenario. So, you know, we love someone who's out of control and they're struggling. And then that, that, um, that, that person who's struggling has poor choices. They might, they might not have the consequences of the choices that they're making. And as long as they're avoiding them and the enabler is taking care of everything, then this pattern gets locked into something bigger. Um, I, I was watching a Netflix show and, and one of the teenagers said in it, um, do you actually think that I am so pathetic that I can't do anything by myself? And I thought about that, and that's really where the enabling rescuer, there's lots of terms that we can use for it, um, starts thinking that they're helping, but they're actually creating a belief system that, that, is, that is partnered with our own belief system as the enabler. It, it creates a belief system in, in the victim, in the, in the other, um, that they can't do it, that they're pathetic, that they're wounded, that there's something wrong with them. And then they become lost and sad and motivated, unmotivated, and they stop trying to do the things that we really want them to do, even though we're helping them so that they do that. It's really an interesting cycle. So I thought today that I would start with what are these different faces of the enabler, okay? And the faces means like, these are just some that I came up with. I've got five. I'm sure there are so many more. But these are the ones that came right to my top of mind when I was writing this um, last night and this morning. So when the enabler starts sort of looking at another and 
starting to wonder, what am I going to do about that? What happens is it hits a core belief or a pattern within that person. So I'm going to use myself as an example. If I am triggered or I am worried about one of my children or about my partner or about someone I'm coaching, and I have a core belief or a pattern, then I'm going to press that pattern onto that person. It's natural. It's what, you know, we don't, if we're not aware that we're doing it, we just keep passing it down the line. So an example, and the first one I came up with was lust. Lust is sort of that, <clears throat> it's at the core of addiction. It's at the core of um, out of control. It's at the core of needfulness. It's at the core of what drives us for more. You know, if this is better, if this is good, then more is better. So there's this insatiable lust, and that is for success or love or connection or wealth or, you know, better body. It doesn't really matter what it is. But we have a perception that if things were just a little bit better, then we can step in and shape it and boost it up. Whether it's, you know, with our spouses trying to create more income, better house, bigger neighborhood, so there's better schools. Whether it's our kid with homework so that they could get good grades so that we get recognition. It doesn't really matter, but it starts with us. So this lust is, if that was good, then more must be better. Okay? And the driving force underneath lust is a thrive for connection. True, authentic connection. Does that make sense? The other one, the next one I came across, the other face of um, enabling is fear. And at the core of someone who is embodying fear, who's letting fear drive them, is this lack of trust. Lack of trust in the world. Lack of trust in others. Lack of trust in themselves. They don't want to feel suffering. They don't want to see where it goes, where it might hurt. So everything that they're doing is out of fear to stop something so there's no pain, so that there's no consequences, so that there's no like deep grieving, whether it's, you know, my child moved out, or I have to end a relationship, or I have to quit a job. It's, it's all based on driving this internal pattern of fear. Um, and this is this is, comes up in our personal stories. It also comes a lot up a lot with parents and loved ones with addiction, which is God. I if I cut him off, he's going to live on the streets. I know what that's going to be like. I don't want to do that. And so our fear prevents us from allowing that person to have their own consequences, their own life. Okay. Um, the next one is the enforcer, and I love this one. I when this one showed up, I was like, whoa, what's that one? So the enforcer is that fierce warrior energy that's like, I need to do something. I need to do something to help. I need to do something to force it. And so what they do is they use this warrior energy to dictate, to push, to, um, to push away harm, to protect, to fight for what's right. And, you know, this happens in, mo in moms and it happens in dads. But it's like this fists up, I'm going to scrunch anybody that hurts my kid. Or if I hear something bad about a teacher, or if I think that you're, you know, play it out in any scenario that you want. The enforcer is someone who thinks that they're here to protect. And if that person looks like they're wobbling or they're hurting, I'm going to protect you. And I'm going to come out big and I'm going to come out strong. Now, if that's an internal pattern and belief, why do you think you have to fight for things? Why do you think you have to get big and be the enforcer? It's an interesting question. Um, the next one, the next face of enabling is the sensitive. And the sensitive, you know, uh, we will continue to talk about the highly sensitive person. Why the sensitive is here in this enabling conversation is that the sensitive gets overwhelmed with things. People, moods, um, environments, all of that. So what the sensitive does is they move to control. And they have to control so that they feel better. They have to control so that things are calmer. Or they might notice that their child is overwhelmed, so they're going to control the environment to keep their child in sort of a homeostasis. Um, so when they control everything in order to decrease their own anxiety, their own worry, or to protect someone that they see is reacting. So sensitivity comes into this in such an interesting way. And then, of course, there's the, the stereotypical hoverer. 
I want to, oh yeah, that, this is true. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Um, the helicopter mom, the helicopter dad, the hoverer, okay? And, and, and let's just call him the hoverer because whether it's someone who's trying to um, learn how to delegate in work, or learn how to separate as a parent, or learn how to trust a spouse when they when they start on a new direction. You know, it's that hovering, that like, watch, watch, watch. What are they doing? What are they doing? Scan it, figure it out, try to anticipate what they're what they're doing, and and to be on top of it. And it seems to me, and I may be wrong on this, and you are welcome to join me and and come up with a comment um, that a hover is all about usefulness. They want a place to feel useful. They feel, uh, they feel useless. They feel like their opinion doesn't matter. They feel like they don't know who they are. And so to micromanage and to make somebody else feel useful makes them feel useful. To make someone else have some, some success. And this happens a lot in schools with parents. You know, whether it's helping with the homework, helping in the classroom, planning all the parties. It's like, it's like I don't know what I want to do with my life, so I want to feel useful. And so I'm going to hover over my kids and make sure they're doing more than any kid could do so that we all have something we are succeeding at. So again, these enabling patterns come back to us, our belief systems and our patterns. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is that when we have an enabling relationship between, like, say, a parent and a child or in two love relationships, usually the one thing that will tip an enabler over, you know, in that area of the other struggling, or the thing that this person does not want this person to do for them, is karmic. It means that they're here to figure out how to go in and look at that one thing and find out how do you learn trust? How do you learn fear? How do you, look, how do you feel useful? How do you feel um, accepting of the pace of the world and what you can do with it? So, you know, it's karmic. That's the thing to remember, is that we are destined to come together and do this dance until one of us wakes up and goes, why are we doing this dance? What are we gonna do about this? Okay, so um, I use an exercise that Alan Seal uses in um, his Transformational Presence Leadership and Coaching, which is the enlightened dialogue, where you take a word like maybe fear or control, and you put it out there, and then you look at it from all different sides until you get a deeper, better understanding of how it relates to you. So I'm gonna encourage you to take some of these faces of enabling and put them out there and explore them by yourself and see what it looks like. Because I think when you can transform your opinion, your um, belief, your pattern, you transform it, you shift it into something else and then you start bringing that shifted perspective into the relationship. So you change your lineal line, you change it up, you change it down. So it's possible when we are working on enabling in our patterns to be working in the past and the future and the present all at the same time by just shifting something within ourselves. So enabling comes from fear, it comes from control, it comes from um, excessive need to, to, to feel useful, to feel empowered. It comes from a lot of different places. So I invite you to explore. What is it, where does it come from in you? And if you'd like some help with that, or if you're curious about what I do, you can always give me a call. My number's on my website at denisedrydencoaching.com. We can book some time to talk, we can email chat, and you can also watch some of my other videos. So thank you very much for hanging in there today and talking about enabling. Have a great Sunday and have a great week. You take care. Bye-bye.